What's up, everyone? Okay, so a couple announcements before I get started with this. This is actually this video I've been thinking about making as a video, and I've been talking with some friends of mine about this, but I decided I'm just going to do it as a live stream because I need to tell the story of this because it relates to how I began on YouTube and why I began on YouTube. Uh, but I need to announce that I just released the new Beato book 4.0, to correspond with the anniversary, the four year anniversary of this channel, which is this week. I actually put up my first, uh, the channel trailer on the 2nd of June, which was uh, about three weeks after my mom passed away in 2016. And I put my first video up on January 8th, two days from now. So in two days from now, it will be four days, or it will be four years from when I started my channel. And this is the, uh, Beato book 4.0. What is new in the book? It's 500 pages long now. I expanded the um, uh, explanation of modal triads. I have a new ch uh, chapter on chords for songwriters. Um, another one on modal chords for songwriters. I have uh, another chapter on string skipping concepts and etudes, uh, linear modal studies, a lot more of those. Uh, parallel major and minor, actually explaining it properly in there. Things that I assumed that people knew, but realized that actually is not in my book. Well, it is now. Um, I have a section on musical palindromes, which is from a video, which is I think is very interesting. You're thinking a palindrome is a word that is, is spelled the same, frontwards and backwards. Uh, modal scale inversions. Um, and uh, uh, which goes along with that. And then there's a bunch of corrections in there too. So that's a new Beato book 4.0. There's a discount code that is RB605 uh, to get $10 off that. And also if you, uh, there's a discount on the My Ear Training course, 30% off with the same discount code RB605. Uh, but any of you that have already bought my book, you should have gotten a uh, an email that you can pay what you want for the upgrade. Every year that I do a new upgrade, it's been almost a year and a half since I did the last upgrade, the 3.0. Um, and every year I do uh, a pay what you want um, link so you can get it. If you didn't get the email, write to me through the website, but check your spam folder first because a lot of times it goes there. So I, I do very few emails through my email list. I mean, a couple times a year, if that. Uh, anyways, okay, so let me talk about this, about ruining rock music. So I need to set this up by when I started producing. So I started producing bands full-time in 1999. I actually started in 95 with a band called The Tender Idols. And I did a couple of their records. It was just on a whim, but the guitar player of that band was Dave Cobb, at least on the second record, he became the guitar player. I played, played bass in the band for a little bit. But uh, Dave Cobb is a famous producer, one of my old friends. And he produced Jason Isbell, um, Chris Stapleton, all these huge rival sons, all these big records up in Nashville. So Dave was in that band. But I didn't start really producing full time until my band got uh, dropped during one of the big label col uh, consolidations, the first label consolidation that happened in 1999. So just to put in perspective, 1999 uh, was really a big year in music. It was the really kind of the height or beginning of the height of new metal and boy bands peaked in 2000. So 2000 was the biggest um was the biggest year ever in the music business, okay? Because there were all these diamond records, records that sold over 10 million copies. Rock bands from Linkin Park to Creed to, you know, many bands had diamond records. And yet all the boy bands had all these diamond records too, right? And Britney Spears, all these people, huge music business. Well, that's also, 99 is when, when um, Napster came out. Okay, so as MP3 started taking over, it took the music industry, they just couldn't figure out what to do. So I'm starting to do records as a producer, and I'm getting bands that have major label budgets, but typically beginner bands, okay? Uh, an A&R guy would sign a band, and they say, okay, we'll send them to Rick, because uh, I was known as a guy that could help them with their songs, writing them. I could play their parts if need be, if people couldn't play, and... 
I, I could um, record and mix the record. Okay, so just give an all-in budget and, and I would make the record. So what I started noticing around 2003 or so is that A&R guys, they're the guys that sign records, sign rec uh, recording artists. They're still, that's what they're called, artists and repertoire. A&R guys started signing people that had singers. That was it. Didn't matter if the band had a good image. Didn't matter if anyone could play. If they could have someone to sing, they'd bring them to someone like me or a number of my friends, actually, that, were, that did this, that were writers. And we would write songs for the bands. And it's awful. And then we would fix all of their parts. If they couldn't sing that well, we'd, uh, we'd fix their parts. If their drummer couldn't play well, you'd have to fix all their drum parts, everything. They didn't have budgets to bring in studio guys because what they used to do back in the day is they'd bring in studio musicians to play. That's why you had people, uncredited people on records, guys like Josh Fries, who plays with the Perfect Circles on a million records. Uh, but they would, bring in, uh, they would bring in guys that were not only... Um, uh, that were not only session drummers, session guitar players to, to fix parts. This has been going on since the beginning of, of, of music. There are some very famous records with some of the most famous records of all time that had session players on that are not credited. Okay, I'm not going to say what they were, uh, but yeah, there are some really big records you'd be shocked to have session players on that you think it's the band playing. Or maybe it's just one person. So... Um, well, this isn't my fault completely. What I started realizing as it went on, the years went on into the late 2000s, and you started getting all, all these, you know, copy of a copy of a copy, new metal bands. That's pretty much what I was doing a lot of. I did singer songwriter bands, and there were a few great artists that I got to work with. But the essentially the A and R people took over the um, they took over the, the industry, and they were signing people based on how they looked and they didn't care if they had any songs because they would hire their friends or people that were signed to their own publishing companies to come in and write the songs for them. And I knew this was wrong. I knew it was wrong, but I also, you know, that was the only way to be a producer in the music business at that time. And I wasn't getting the huge production projects later on. It was only a handful of people that produced all the bands that ultimately, I mean, these people would come in and they'd make records, you know, four bars at a time. So they would bring in a drummer, they would play four bars, they'd quantize it, they'd copy and paste the verses, they'd get the chorus, they'd copy and paste those things. This is where all this beat detecting hyper quantization came in. Uh, they get they get pro people to come in that would play great parts and then they would fix their parts. They were obsessed with everything being on grid. That was the thing. Everything being auto-tuned, everything being on grid. And I got to the point where I said, okay, I can't do this anymore. And in 2015, I started, um, uh, I started going on Facebook and doing these live videos for teaching teaching people about ear training, about songwriting, things like that. And, and, um, and I felt, wow, I'm actually doing something that is worthwhile here. Now, I was still producing at the time because I had a family. I had to keep making a living. But, um, but that, start, that was a fulfilling thing to get on there. And then... When I started my YouTube channel, when Rhett came in, Rhett Schull, who was my intern, and I came in, uh, he came in and he said, you should start a YouTube channel. I mean, I was doing stuff on Facebook, literally. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a video on Facebook from May 31st of, uh, of 2016 where I did a live stream, and I had Lennon, my daughter here, and it was an ear training thing. And I was showing how you can teach your kids ear training. And I had Lennon sit there and I would play intervals and have her sing. I'd play pitches. She'd sing the notes. And she was only a little kid at the time, right? Uh, I think she was six or so. And, but, but it really, Facebook wasn't, um, at that point, started to, to become a place where uh, they wouldn't push your videos out to people at all. And, and uh, so there was no community there 
like there is on YouTube. And Rhett was the one that said, you have to be where there's a community. You have to build a community. And that's what I did with YouTube. So you guys hear me, any of you that follow this channel know when I say that the reason that I'm on here and I teach things for free is because I want to give back whatever I can, whether it's the knowledge on music theory, on songwriting, on arranging, on how to mic amplifiers, on how to mic drum sets, whatever it is, anything that I've learned in my life about music that I've been fortunate enough because I've had incredibly good teachers, I am giving back. And that's what I've been doing for the past four years on here. And it's really important to me. This is this is the most important thing I've ever done. And I feel like I've actually, that I'm making a difference for myself. I don't know about for anyone else. I hope I'm making a difference. But for myself, all those years of helping the music business, helping these these people that never deserve to have record deals, n- not all of them, but a lot of them, that I was even part of that. And I did not play a big part in that. I was not a, I didn't have big, big successful records or anything. I had a couple of successful records, but, but, uh, but this is what was going on. And this is really what ruined rock music because it was the era of faceless bands. It was the era of, of bands where you didn't know the names of anyone in the band. In the 90s, everybody knew the guys in Alice in Chains, in Nirvana, in Pearl Jam, in Stone Temple Pilots, in Soundgarden. In the 80s, you knew all the people that were in Def Leppard, in every big 80s metal band, in Motley Crue. You knew everybody in those bands. You knew the people in Winger. You knew the people in Metallica. Everybody knew everyone in every band that was their favorite band at the time. Now, part of that is MTV, because you saw their faces on here. And, and you could relate to that. You, and you started, you still had CDs that printed the names of the people in the back. And you would look at those things and memorize them. You even knew the names of producers. You knew Butch Vig, who produced Nirvana. You knew, uh, well, you didn't know Rick Parasher that produced uh, uh, Temple of the Dog and the first Pearl Jam record, unfortunately. But, um, but that was a big, big thing knowing people in bands. And you go back historically in the 70s and 60s, everybody knew the names of everybody that were, were in their bands. But the era of the early 2000s became what I used to call, even during the time, the era of faceless bands, where you didn't know the names of anyone in the bands. You couldn't even name the lead singer in any of these bands, and which is one of the reasons why I don't do a lot of music from the early 2000s and the mid to and the late 2000s, you know? Um, now there's some incredibly good music that came up, indie rock things that came up during the, uh, during this time period too. It was, this was really commercial rock music that, that sold worldwide. And some of these bands were huge in the, uh, you know, even in up until 2008 or nine or so, they were still selling a lot of records. You had bands that were selling 20 million records, you know, not one record, but worldwide. So anyways, this is why I'm on YouTube now. This is one of the big reasons why I do song analysis with what makes this song great. Because I want to teach people about how great artists, bands wrote their songs. Michael, thank you very much. Your sting analysis was brilliant. Gained a new appreciation for, for Fortress Around Your Heart. Long time. Fire. Thank you very much. David, thank you so much. Owner of Ty. Tyler Land Studios is considered one of the most important resources. Thank you so much, David. Really appreciate that on Super Chat. Uh, Luke, thank you so much. So this is the thing, right? What makes this song great is really a way to, to hopefully help a new generation, even if the style of music is different. I love contemporary music. I just did a video with my dear friend, Tosin Abasi, that came out, who's one of the most forward-thinking musicians that I know. Um, and I support contemporary music as well, but I think that there's a whole generation of people that do rock music with real instruments that, uh, you know, that can write great songs, but they need the tools to do these. And the, the techniques that people used back in the day are still the same techniques. They actually go back to, <laughs> to the 1500s, 1400s, after Gregorian chant, you know, Renaissance music, 
Baroque music, classical music, romantic music, they all use the same concepts, okay? Uh, a good melody is a good melody for a particular reason. Uh, but the way that people arrange things, that comes down to production. So what makes the song great is also about production, okay? Uh, okay, I'm going to announce again, the new Beato Book 4.0 is out. The discount code that's on the screen here, RB605, you can get $10 off on it. I've been working on it for the last year and a half, updating it. Um, it's got, it's up to 500 pages now. It's like 40 more pages in it. I expanded the the uh, the, th the explanation of modal triads. Uh, I have a new section called chords for songwriters, modal chords for songwriters. That's how to get outside of the uh, the keys that you're in and adding in new chords. So it can be, you can have more interesting, sophisticated songs where you don't have to go one, four, five, and six all the time. Uh, I have a thing on a uh, new thing on string skipping concepts. That's for for guitar players and etudes. Linear modal etudes. Those are for anyone. Uh, parallel major and minor. Explaining what those are because I've been using those a lot in my live discussions lately. Um, a thing called musical palindromes related to a video that I did about two years ago that I was really like. It's called musical palindromes and negative harmony. Um, and then uh, modal scale inversions, and then there's a bunch of corrections in the book. So that's for sale now. It's the 4.0 to correspond with four years of my channel, which will be two days from now. So um, I was talking with my sister earlier, my oldest sister today, and we were talking about the fact that my mom had just died. And my parents were massively big supporters of me as a musician. They They just... They um, they were the ones that encouraged me all the time in music. Over over, I mean, just they just were thought it was great that I was a musician. And not many parents at the time. None of my friends that were musicians. None of their parents encouraged them to be musicians. Not all of them, but most of them did not encourage them to be musicians. But my parents did. I got, I was able to have lessons. I took guitar lessons in high school. I played in the school orchestra. I played bass. I got to go to school for music, undergrad and master's degree. I was fortunate enough to to learn from some of the best engineers and, and musicians out there for, uh, for music production. And so this is why I am I give back on my channel. Um, uh, Muko Joe, thank you so much. Appreciate that. So that th this is, uh, you know, when I say that I ruined rock music, I felt like I contributed to it. And I've always felt I needed to, to repent for that. And my way of repenting is to try not to, uh, uh, is to not be a part of that anymore. Not be a part of it. It's, it's, um, and obviously music has changed just in the four years since I got on here. Social media is um, is way more powerful than it was, obviously. And, you know, I had my friend Lee Scalar that was on my channel recently. Lee started his channel two months ago and he hit 100,000 subscribers this week. Lee has just turned 73 years old, you know. And you can... Um, I mean, where else could you do that? It's unbelievable. He has a voice. He's been on records for the last five, six decades, six decades. I don't even know a lot, long time since the early seventies. And now he has a voice out there where he's not just a guy in the background, in the band, on the record. He's telling stories of his, of, of what happened uh, uh, you know, with the creation of a lot of these songs or what happened when he was on tour. And this kind of, this is the same kind of a thing that um, that I'm talking about, this giving back. And he loves it. I, I, talk, I was talking with Lee about it, uh, about when he starts touring again, if he's going to keep doing it. He says, of course, of course, he's going to keep doing it because it's, uh, he, it's, it's been incredibly fulfilling to him as it has to me and my, and my dear friend, Tim Pierce, the same thing. Tim and I talk about this all the time. We talk about this and Phil X, my other dear friend, 
Uh, so if you guys don't don't subscribe to Tim's channel or Phil X, subscribe to their channels. They're they're great. Phil has been putting up videos. Uh, uh, some he's done some amazing videos lately. Of uh, uh, did a couple on Van Halen that are absolutely killer. Uh, Radio Spirit, who did Co- Coheed and Cambria's production? You know, um, I think that Nick Rasculinitz did one of their records. Uh, Nick is a killer producer that uh, did the um, one of my favorite um, sounding records, rock records, which was Black Gives Way to Blue by uh, by Alice in Chains, which came out in 2009. It's the it's actually the first record with. Um, with William Duvall, who was their new singer, and Nick produced it, and Randy Staub mixed it, and it is a massive sounding record, one of the biggest sounding rock records I have ever heard. If you guys don't know, Black Gives Way to Blue it had the song "Check My Brain" on it, and if you're interested in recording studio stuff, they did a whole series. They recorded, uh, I think, a lot of Dave Grohl's studio. Um, I forget what his studio was. Uh, probably the same studio he has with a Neve console. Um, and they they have about 12 episodes that are on YouTube that are really killer if you like inside the stuff where they're making making the record. Uh, let's see, Timmy, you cannot name, one cannot name the members of other bands, singers, Ariana Grande, Ed Sheeran, Taylor, Swift, Katy Perry, and so on. That's, yeah, you can't. I know, it's it's sad. Um I could name people like Lee Scalar, and he was a session musician because, and Larry Carlton, and and uh, and all the people that I revere, that I've had Robin Ford, all these people that I revere, Steve Gadd, and Jay Graydon, all these great studio players. I knew all their names. You know why? Because they were on the back of all the album covers that I grew up listening to, and Steve Lukather and Jeff Beccaro, all those guys, just geniuses, all of them. Uh, give a love, love your work knowledge. You're providing the next generation, current ones that will keep up the great work. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Greetings from Italy. Vinny, what's up? Uh, how about what makes this song great? Jeff Beck. Yes. Yes. Uh, Constantin. Let's see. Rick, can you explain music, not American or UK band, but maybe Russian rock music or maybe Indian Korean other styles? I can. You know, I, I have... Um, uh, Phil, good to see you. Thank you so much. There's a Russian um, guy that follows my my channel, Yevgeny, his name is, who has a, a Russian version of my What Makes This Sound Great. It's called Rick Beata Rus, R-U-S. And he goes through and he overdubs in Russian my, all of my voice over my What Makes This Sound Great videos. And he's got a few thousand subscribers on it, but he's done both. I want to say 50 of them or so. And it's a lot of work translating it into Russian and doing the doing the voiceovers. Uh and it's really cool. And um uh anyway, so so yes, and I I would uh I will absolutely do uh do um some other genres of music. I have to get through my my uh last nine what makes this song great till I hit 100. I'm not sure what I'm going to do for the 100th episode, but I'm taking suggestions, not here in the comments section, but I'm going to do one on Instagram. Uh, I'm going to do a thing where I'm taking suggestions for the um, for the uh, for the hundredth episode. I'll do an Instagram story. Everybody makes fun of me because I don't know how to really do Instagram stories. I have to call Red Up or ask Billy uh, about how to do Instagram stories every time I try and do one. So I'm gonna I I I promise I'm gonna learn to do. Instagram stories this week. That's that's one of my goals. Um, okay, so um, new Beato book 4.0 is out as of about an hour ago. It came out actually. It's on the website. There's no more Beato book 3.0. Uh, for those of you, I um, we sent out a an email to everybody. Pay what you want. Link. Uh, if you didn't get it and you own the book already, any version of it, look in your spam folder or write to me through the website and just let me know that you didn't get it. Uh, there's a discount code for it on here, RB605. You get $10 off on it. Um, 
uh, through the weekend here. And um, the uh, um, uh, and the my ear training course is thirty percent off with the same discount code RB six oh five. That's how I make a living. I make a living selling stuff in my store and through the Beato Club. If you don't know about that, you can check out that on my website as well. But that's how I make a living for my channel where I can do these videos. And I don't have to endorse gear and I don't have to do, and I don't begrudge anyone that does either. I don't have to do any type of sponsored content or partnerships with anyone or anything like that. And I don't like to do stuff where I beg people to like my videos or subscribe, even though I probably should, I should tell people that they should like and comment because that's actually, Everybody reminds me, um, that's actually how your videos, you get more people to watch your videos is by doing that. But it's kind of been the thing where I don't tell people until the end and I never say to like and comment. I did on one video this past week. Um, so for those of you that haven't watched my Joni Mitchell video, please watch Joni Mitchell. You should know who Joni Mitchell is. She's one of the most important songwriters of all time. Really important to be familiar with her music, I think. I listen to her record, Blue, which came out in the mid-70s, and I cry every time I listen to it. I can't help it. I cry. There's a song called A Case of You. Oh, my God. It's unbelievable. Man. <sighs> Whew. That's, that's, that's uh, a lot to, uh, to take in right there. Yes, yeah, so Joni Mitchell... I did the video on Sting where I broke down a few of Sting's songs too. Definitely check that out. Sting is absolutely brilliant and as I say, uncopyable. You can see why when I talk about it, but uh, uh, I could have gone on and on and on about Sting songs. Uh, Jim, do I know Bernard Purdy? Of course I know Bernard Purdy who drummed on a lot of the early Beatle records. You know, they people say that. I don't know if that's true because um, I don't know Bernard personally, but... I know plenty of people that know Bernard personally, and, and none of them have ever told me that, which is which is interesting because I think that they would that they would have mentioned it. Uh, I see in the comments here, Nick says, "How about a Badfinger song?" I love Badfinger, and I love the song "Day After Day," and I probably would have done it so far. Thank you, Robert. But does anyone know "Day After Day"? And I know and "Baby Blue." I mean, "Day After Day" was one of my favorite songs as a kid. Okay. But does anyone know the song Day After Day or Baby Blue? Baby Blue was the last song on Breaking Bad when Walt was killed. For those of you that watch Breaking Bad, sorry to tell you that Walt dies at the end. But uh, <laughs> but they play Baby Blue when that happens. Phil, I could drink a case of you and still be on my feet. You cry too, Phil. Exactly. That is that that is one of the that's Joni Mitchell line that Phil just put on there. Um, he he quoted the a case of you, I could drink of a case of you and still be on my feet. It's absolutely brilliant lyrics with the most beautiful melody, and it and it just makes you cry. Sorry, un unbelievable. I don't talk about lyrics a lot in here. But we, when you get into Joni and Sting, people like that, and Bob Dylan, you get into these these incredible lyricists. I was listening to John Prine over the weekend. I've been listening to a lot of Nick Drake. Um, so anyhow, I'm atoning for my sins for being a music producer and fixing people's parts and replaying their parts for them and contributing to the nameless, faceless bands of the 2000s. So I'm here at your service to make YouTube videos to help people in however I can to improve your songwriting, improve your improv improvisations, uh, and and take anything that I know and use for your for yourself. Beato Book 4.0 just released today. Check it out. Discount code for that ten dollars off RB605. If you already have my Beato Book, you should have gotten an email with the pay what you want link for the upgrade. If you didn't, check your spam folder. And if, you, if it's not there, email me through the website, okay, through rickbeato.com. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for being here and for, for the last four years. You're the best. See you later.